If one of the hydrogen atoms in a cyclohexane is replaced by another substituent, like a CH3 shown here, the result is a mono-substituted cyclohexane, right? And mono just means one, right? Um, and so what we find here is when that happens, the two chair conformations, the mono-substituted cyclohexane, are not equivalent. And so, for example, if we look at this picture of the molecule here, the CH3, which is shown here in one group, is in the axial position. But when it undergoes a chair flip, now it's in the equatorial position. So these guys are not equivalent. Now, because they have the same molecular formula, but differ due to rotations about the single bonds, these two non-equivalent chair forms are conformers of each other. So these guys right here are conformers, right? Now, oh, here, they're conformers conformers of each other. Now, the two chair conformations of methyl cyclohexane do rapidly interconvert, but they're not equally favored. At any given time, about 95% of the molecule exists in a form where the CH3 is in the equatorial position, and then the remaining 5% exists in the form with the axial CH3 group. So other mon monosubstituted cyclohexanes exhibit the same trend. So we know that there's a, a, an idea here um, that we can make a generalization that a monosubstituted cyclohexane is lower in energy, which means it's more stable. Lower energy means more stable when the substituent, and what we're talking about here with this substituent is it's the big substituent, right? So CH3 is obviously a lot bigger than the hydrogen, occupies an equatorial position, right? So the equatorial conformer is more stable than the axial conformer because there is more room for the substituent in the equatorial position, right? It points out into space. There is more room here, okay? So to see why, we're going to compare the methyl cyclohexane with the axial CH3 group to the methyl cyclohexane with the equatorial CH3 group. Um, right here. So when we look at the axial position, which is right here, this is axial, this is A, um, we're going to notice that this has some significant steric strain. And so there's a, you already know, there's a couple ways to look at this. And so we're looking at this um, right here in the Newman projection, okay? And the bonds are numbered for you in blue. So that was a fun trick, but when we kind of go up here and look at this and the bonds here are numbered in blue, there's one, which is here. And then two is behind there. So one, two, that's three, four, five are aligned with each other. They're right here. And then that's six. And what I want you to notice here is that these groups are very, very close. And so in this gauche configuration, there is significant steric strain here. Um, and so that means that that makes that less stable because of that significant steric strain. Um, the other thing we can see here is in the chair position, which is shown right here again with the blue numbers kind of showing you everything is. So here's number one. There's something called a diaxial interaction. Now, di just means two, and this is called a 1-3 diaxial interaction, which means you have the one here, and that is interfering with the third position here to give steric strain. Um, and, and so the, this here, that diaxial 
means two axial groups are interacting to give steric strain. Now, I want to put some words to that. So when we talk about that one three diaxial interaction, right? Um, the one and the three identify the relative positions. on the ring for the interacting substituents. Okay. Now, no steric strain exists when the CH3 group is in the equatorial position. And so here we're looking at the CH3 in the equatorial position. And what we see here is the CH3 is pointing out into space. It is way far away from these hydrogens here. And so, right, there's, there's no steric strain there. We don't see any of that. And that's what makes it more um, stable, right? It's because there's no steric strain. Now, what can further this is that um, we find that even though all non-hydrogen groups prefer the equatorial position over the axial position, uh, some groups <clears throat> have a stronger preference than others. Um, and this can be seen in table 4.2 when we look at some of these percentages, okay, of the two chair conformations with various monosubstituted hexane, cyclohexanes. So look, this is a cyclohexane, and we're going to use this substituent. And the way this table works is each of these is the substituent that's being represented here. And I want you to notice there's the OH, the NH2, the CH3, right? But look what happens when we start to add bulk. There's the methyl, the ethyl. That's a um, isopropyl group. Um, this is a t-butyl group, right? So we're, we're really adding some bulk here. I want you to notice that as these get bigger, right, the percent of the um, cyclohexane that where the, the big group is in the axial position decreases because of that increased steric strain. And so we can make, a, 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 we can summarize that by saying the bulkier The substituent on a cyclohexane ring, the more favored is the chair conformation. with the substituent in the equatorial position, okay? So with that idea in mind, we can identify two key trends, right, in this table. Um, and I talked about one of the trends, right, where we're getting bulkier here, but I didn't talk about the difference between OH, NH2, and CH3. And so the bulkiness here does increase where in, in the order where OH is the smallest and then NH2 and then CH3. Um, and so one of the things that we notice here is the bulkiness of a substituent increases as the atom at the point of attachment has more sigma bonding pairs of electrons and fewer lone pairs. So we can also say here that bulkiness of a substituent increases, right, as the atom at the point of attachment has more sigma bonding pairs
of electrons and fewer lone pairs, right? And so from that, as far as size is concerned, OH is gonna have two lone pairs, and that's smaller than NH2, which only has one lone pair, which is smaller than CH3, which doesn't have any lone pairs. And so you can see the trend again, right? Where we're gonna have more um, of the cyclohexane in the axial position, where the substituent's in the axial position here because it's smaller and less as we get larger. Now, the reason that we see this is that the um, pair of electrons involved in the sigma bond extends farther away from the atom at the point of attachment than a lone pair does, right? So the pair of electrons involved in a sigma bond extends farther away from the atom at the point of attachment than a lone pair, okay? And so we've already talked about that second trend, right, which I just think is easier to see as the bulkiness increases. Um, the atom at the point of attachment is bonded to more alkyl groups, right? So what we see here is um, there's only, this atom is only bonded to one alkyl group, this atom's bonded to two alkyl groups, this atom's bonded to three alkyl groups, this is much bulkier than this group, this is bulkier than this group, and this is bulkier than that group. And so bulk increases as we have more um, alkyl groups bonded to the atom that's at the point of attachment. So, now, we've talked about cyclohexanes with nothing attached, just hydrogens. We've talked about monosubstituted cyclohexanes, um, but turns out we can also have disubstituted hexanes. So, with disubstituted hexanes, that means they have two substituents we have to take into account the relationship of each substituent on the plane of the ring, okay? So you're gonna have a ring, and, and the question you ask yourself is, are these substituents gonna be on the same side of the ring, right? Are they cis to each other, cis the same side? Are they on opposite sides? Are they gonna be trans to each other? Now, remember, <clears throat> and I've written this out for you, a chair flip does not switch the substituents from one side of the plane to the other. So that cis-trans relationship between any pairs of substituents on a cyclohexane ring is independent of the chair conformation the species is in, okay? And so what another way to say this is that substituents that are cis to each other on a cyclohexane ring, remain cis to each other after a chair flip. They're just flipping to the other side of the plane, right? But they're still gonna be on the same side of the ring with each other. And those that are trans remain trans, right? So they're still gonna be on opposite sides of the ring after a ring flip. Since the cis-trans relationship of any pair of substituents is unaffected by a chair flip, it's often more convenient to represent substituted cyclohexanes using something called a Hayworth projection, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. All right, so this is an example of a Hayworth projection. Um, what we're gonna see here is that um, the ring is depicted as being planar, okay? Where this darkened part is coming out towards you. So this is the Hayworth projection, okay? And what you're gonna see here is if both of these are coming up, they are cis, and so they're cis to each other. And then if one is above the plane of the ring and one is below the plane of the ring, that is trans. 
Now, sometimes it's convenient to show this using, um, instead of drawing the Hayworth projection every time, it's convenient to show this using dashes and wedges. If things are on the same side of the rings plane, you are going to see them have either both dashes or both wedges here. Okay, so that's the top view. Another view could very easily be this. And so what we're saying is, as long as these are both dashes or they're both wedges, they're going to be cis. If one is a dash and one is a wedge, they are going to be trans. And you can see that, of course, a little bit better on this Hayworth projection. Now, I want us to look at Hayworth projections and cis and trans, okay? So when we look at this, because each substituent on a cyclohexane ring is more stable in the equatorial position as compared to the axial position, we can pretty well predict the more stable conformation of a number of di-substituted cyclohexanes. And so I want us to look at this example here. So we have a, um, a cis-1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane, and we have a chair conformation where these both of these groups are equatorial. Okay, that's the favored chair conformation. When you do a chair flip, all of a sudden both of these are diaxial. And so due to steric strain, these are not going to be as, this one is not going to be as favored. This is going to be favored. Okay. Now, in trans 1,3 dimethylcyclohexane, both chair conformations are equally favored because both have one axial and one equatorial. With the chair flip, the axial CH3 group right here becomes the equatorial CH3 group right here. And then, of course, the one that's equatorial becomes axial. And you can see that these are numbered. And so you can see how that's different. Now, I want to show you something. Notice the shift here. When you push this up, all of a sudden, one is there, two is here, and then three is at the point. Okay? So this shifts up. And it's almost like everything kind of shifts around a little bit. Um, you also see that here. This is going to be pushed up in the chair flip. Now that's at one. This is at two. And then three is here. Okay, so everything kind of shifts over one. So I really want you to notice that there. Okay, so let's fill in our blanks. Every substituent on a cyclohexane ring favors an equatorial position rather than an axial position, and the most stable chair conformation can usually be predicted for a number of di-substituted hexanes. Now, we have talked a lot about conformers, okay? And so the rest of this chapter is going to talk about constitutional isomers and how to identify constitutional isomers. So constitutional isomers are the second type of isomer we're going to discuss. Constitutional isomers are also known as structural isomers, okay? Um, and they have the exact same molecular formula, but differ in their connectivity. So if we go back to the flow chart, we have the same molecular formula, but we differ by connectivity here. So what do we mean by differ by connectivity? Well, for example, we have cyclobutane and butuanine. Both of these have the same molecular formula, but one is a ring and one has a double bond. So these are constitutional isomers because they have that different connectivity. Now, here's the deal, and this is what you got to kind of convince yourself of, is these two guys are not constitutional isomers of each other. They have the same molecular formula, but um, they, are, they are the identical molecule. Um, and so there's a couple ways to tell, but the best way to tell is to name them. 
We're going to go through what the book says, but I honestly believe, which is on the next uh, chapter, as to figure out how to identify things that are constitutional isomers. But basically, you just need to figure out, figure out how to name them. Um, and so when we look at this and we go through and, and name things, right, this is our longest uh, carbon chain. I've, I've circled it there. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so that's going to be a hexane, right? And then one, two, three, four. So that's going to be two, four, dimethyl hexane. That's going to be the name of it. Well, now I'm going to come over here to this guy. And I'm going to circle my longest chain because that's the way I like to live my life. I see there's one, two, three, four, five, six hexane, one, two, one, two, three, four. So again, it's two, four dimethyl hexane. So same name, that's the same molecule. That means those are not constitutional isomers. Now, I do want to run through um, the rules for identifying constitutional isomers in your book. And so here's what your book says. For each molecule, identify the parent chain or ring. And we know from naming, this is the longest continuous chain or ring of carbons that contains um, the functional group. like the alkene or the carbon-carbon triple bond, okay? Then you want to number the carbons in the chain or the ring. When you do this, you want to make sure um, that the carbon atoms with the double or triple bond receive the lowest number. So carbon atoms with the double bond or triple bond receive the lowest number and then you want to of course once you do that have your substituents have the lowest number you know so if there's a tie or if there's a way to to number one way or the other you want your substituents to have the lowest number then you're going to establish the relative connectivities along the parent chain or ring um and so what we know here is the molecules must have different connectivities and, and therefore constitutional isomers if they differ in a few things, right? So let me do it this way. They are constitutional or structural isomers if they differ in, right, the size of the parent chain or ring, right, the number assigned to the carbons in the multiple bonds. So if they have different numbers, they're going to be constitutional isomers. If they have different numbers of the substituents groups, then they are going to be um, constitutional isomers, right? Or if the identities of the substituents groups attach to the same numbered carbon, Right? So if you have the same number carbon, but you have different substituents there, those are also going to be constitutional isomers. Look, I guarantee. So this is the way the book tells you to do it because they, people can teach naming at all sorts of different places. But I guarantee you can do, this is basically walking through you through the exact same thing as naming. So basically if they have different names, 
then they're constitutional isomers. Okay. So everybody learns in a different way though. So if you don't want to name it, if you want to follow this, then you are more than welcome to do that. Now, I apparently got ahead of myself um, identifying if these were constitutional isomers by naming them before. Um, but this does walk you through the method with and on the front page, on the previous page where it says, look, find the longest carbon chain. It's right here. It's right here. Number, number so that your substituents have the lowest number. So there's two, four here, two, four here. And then both these are methyl groups. So therefore they have to be the same thing. <clears throat> also, they have the same name. So these are not constitutional isomers. They are identical molecules.